All right. Well, let's turn to Romans chapter 8. We're in verse 31 to 39. Certainly one of the most beloved chapters in, uh, in the Bible and for a uh, very, very good reason. Uh, the title of the message is Nothing Can Separate Us. Remember, the chapter began with uh, There's Nothing That Can Dim Us. And it ends with nothing, There's Nothing That Can Separate Us uh, from Our Love That's in Christ, uh, Christ Jesus. Uh, the, the no condemnation, remember we said there's a two therefores in the, in the uh, beginning of the sentence. It means it's not the immediate context, what Paul just said prior, but it's the whole context that we're saved by grace through faith. It's not of ourselves. Paul would say to the church at Ephesians, it's the gift of God, not that of works, so that no one could boast. That's really his theme. He says because of that, there's no condemnation. We said the no was an emphatic no in the Greek, meaning like a, a double negative in English. So it's uh, there, therefore, is no, no, not no, ever, any condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus because we're, we're saved by grace. And then he continues on in these wonderful passages about the fact that we have the Holy Spirit indwelling in us. And we can cry out to God at any time and even address him as Abba, Father. Even when we don't know how to pray, our groanings will be taken by the Holy Spirit and interpreted in a sense and taken before the throne of God uh, where uh, it goes to intercession on our behalf when we don't even have the right words to be able to pray in a very distressing time. Uh, he then goes on and, and talks about, uh, again, this wonderful relationship that we have with God. And this is all how secure we are in it. Uh, and... Uh, and he says, even when things appear to be going wrong, God will still use them for good, which is where we were last time, Romans 8, 28. And, uh, and then that, this passage comes on the heels of it. Paul here, again, teaching a very rabbinical style to primarily a Jewish church in, uh, in Rome at that time. He's going to address uh, some Gentiles so at some point in time here later. So we know that uh, they were both in the church. But uh, again, he teaches in that way by asking questions. And the question we begin with in verse 31 is, what then shall we say to these things? Now, that's the question he asked in chapter 3, verse 5, in chapter 4, verse 1, in chapter 6, verse 1, uh, chapter 7, verse 7, chapter 9, verse 14, and, and as we'll get to later, verse uh, as well, chapter 9, verse 30. Again, what shall we say? Uh, it's a rhetorical question, of course, and then he gives you reasons why you should think about or say something about this. And by the time we get done with this, the appropriate thing that you should say is hallelujah, praise the Lord. I mean, by the time we get through uh, this passage here. Uh, let's, I'm going to read the whole thing together. We'll come back and kind of uh, open it up. Verse 31, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. It is he who condemns. Is it, Christ, uh, it is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of God, uh, from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now I've kind of broken it down to how can we be secure in our relationship with Jesus Christ? How can we be confident in it? He's already said quite a bit, of course, but I think in these, these couple of verses here, he gives us seven, seven reasons. I was going to tell you, this is a big issue for, for a lot of people. I grew up in a church where they didn't believe what I'm about ready to tell you. In fact, they believed that, uh, that you could lose your salvation at the drop of a hat. And they would always tell stories about the, the, the guy, the proverbial guy that would actually trip, slip, maybe cuss, and then get hit by a bus. Not sure if he's in heaven. I mean, it's almost like you have to be living this perfect life, this perfect this Christian life, if you could, without sin, in order to make it to heaven. Both of my grandmothers, both Pentecostal, both love the Lord. I'm thankful for both of them. But uh, both of them would always sign their letters to me 
back in the day, people used to write letters before email and texting. They had actually this paper and they would write on it. But anyway, they would uh, uh, send me these letters and they would always end the letter saying, and stay prayed up because Jesus could come at any time. That's a pretty good exhortation uh, from your grandmother. You should stay prayed up in terms of having a relationship with the Lord. He could come for us, but that's not really what they meant. They meant, you better, you better stay on it, man, in terms of your Christian experience, because if the rapture happens, you're not really right with the Lord. You're going to get left, it was the, uh, uh, was the idea. Uh, and in fact, every Sunday night in church uh, uh, growing up, the reason they had Sunday night uh, services in the church I grew up in is so the pastor could get up and not teach the word of God, but in a sense, preach to the choir. I mean, he would preach an evangelistic message. That's not your biggest crowd on Sunday nights, by the way. I just throw that out there. Uh, and and uh, he would preach this evangelistic message every Sunday night. And, uh, and of course, he had to fill out a report that said how many uh, people would come forward uh, in his little sales report, I call it a sales report, uh, that he would turn in his, to the denomination. And, uh, uh, and he'd have to have some results. Uh, and so, man, he would uh, you know, get to the end of the message. Of course, everybody there was saved. They've been in the church their whole lives. And so then, then you would get to the, what I call the beating the sheep. You know, you, and if you can't get anybody forward and make them feel bad enough, you can always go to prayer. How many of you think you're praying enough? Jesus died for you. What are you doing today? Have you prayed this morning? Have you prayed this afternoon? It's the, you know, it's like, well, you know, your head, the heads are just going down, you know. The, the lash is coming, the lash is coming, you know. And it's like, now who will come forward? I think you need to rededicate your life this, this evening, you know. So it gets a couple of people up there and can fill out the sales report and we're all good. <clears throat> but it was uh, interesting. We call that uh, yo-yo Christianity because sometimes you're up and sometimes you're down. <laughs> sometimes you're up and sometimes you're down. And uh, Paul kind of re rebuffs or refutes that, uh, that idea, certainly in the book of Romans and certainly here in chapter 8. Let's take a look at the first reason why we can have a confidence or be secure in our relationship with Jesus Christ. One, we would say on, based on verse 31, it's because God is consistently for us. There he begins with his rhetorical question, what then shall we say to these things? Uh, if God is for us, who can be against us? You can tell that it's Jewish when they ask a question, answer it with another question. And uh, that's exactly what he, what he does here. If God is for us. Uh, and here the, uh, the Greek class that he uses for if is the, like we hear sometimes, if and it is so. In other words, since. Since God is for us, who can be against us? It is not that things aren't against us uh, in this life at all. They, uh, they are. We all have difficulties at times. It's the idea of the comparison between whatever we might experience in this life compared to the fact that since God is for us, then uh, you know, we should just have a different perspective on the trivial, trivialities of the small things uh, uh, of this world. It's like, well, somebody called me out. I've got a fight to fight in the parking lot. I just thought I'd mention that after church. It's a kid in the sixth grade. I'm going to have to take him on. And I've got six Navy SEALs that are going to help me. You know, it's not really a big issue. You know, I mean, you know, it's this comparison, lesser to the greater. It's not that we don't have problems. It's not that we don't get down. We've got our flesh to deal with. We live in a world that is against antichrist, is against Christ and so forth. Uh, we live in a fallen world. Uh, there is Satan uh, and his cohort trying to tempt us. There are those things. But compared to God being for us, uh, it's really, really nothing. Uh, and again, this is the same same thing that Jesus says in Matthew 4.4 4, when, when Satan says to him, if you are the son of God, then turn these stones into bread. No, he's saying, since you are the son of God, he knows that he is. Uh, <clears throat> James tells us that the demons believe that there's one God. They've got very good theology, by the way. Uh, and they, they tremble even, so they even have an emotional experience. They have good theology and they have an emotional experience when they think about God. Uh, and yet, of course, they're, they're not following the, the Lord. Uh, Satan knows exactly who Jesus is. That's the same idea. If and it is so. But sometimes we're like uh, Jacob, who said in chapter 42, uh, all things are against me. I don't know if you ever, you ever feel like that sometimes, or maybe some things. Sometimes we feel like all things are against us. Uh, we can lose perspective. Of course, Paul has just said all things are working together. They're not against it. In fact, God is even using some of the difficult things in life 
uh, to work for our good and his glory. I like what uh, uh, Gideon said in Genesis 6.13. Don't ask me why I've been um, focusing on uh, scriptures about grumbling lately, but uh, it wasn't in preparation for this message. I just happened to be looking at a few of them recently. <laughs> Gideon says uh, uh, here in Judges 6.13, Oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened to us? I know nobody here has ever said that. Yeah. If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And then uh, Moses had a few bad days. And I love this one in, uh, in Numbers 11, 14. He says, I'm not able to bear all these people alone because the burden is too heavy for me. If you treat me like this, please kill me here and now. <laughs> but I love you, Lord. <laughs> no, it doesn't say that. Uh, Moses had a bad day. We can think that there are other things against, and they are. But in comparison to God being for us, uh, it, it's really, it's really to change our perspective. If God can be is for us, who can be against us? And the idea here is that when you experience and you feel like the world is against you, Romans eight is a pretty good place to uh, to come. Again, uh, the quote from R. A. Torrey says, "It's a good place to rest your head." And, uh, and we need to do that sometime. But it's not the only place in the Bible that echoes uh, these ideas. The Psalms are, are full of it because David had his struggles. David had his, uh, his uh, physical enemies. He certainly had his emotional enemies as well. He was a guy that uh, struggled with depression on a pretty regular basis, apparently, and openly writes about it uh, in the Psalms. Of course, in the Psalms, he's writing about how he's feeling, and then he gets his eyes back on the Lord, and then he comes through the other, the other side. And Psalm 27 is one of those examples uh, where David writes, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? So that's our problem sometimes, living in fear. The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war may rise against me. In this I will be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. Paul's conclusion Hey, if God before us, and he is, since he is, who can be against us really doesn't matter all of that that much if God is for us. Uh, and there's times, certainly, when we need to remind ourselves of that. And it can be through the Psalms, uh, and certainly it can be here in Romans uh, chapter, chapter 8. <laughs> there's uh, certainly lots of uh, you know, very interesting stories told about Abraham Lincoln. And, uh, and we were talking about this uh, with one of the guys, uh, despite the, uh, the recent movie that, uh, uh, that, uh, that, that showed a historical time in his life. What it, what it failed to bring out, unfortunately, Hollywood does this all the time. He was a godly man, loved the Lord, had a tremendous prayer life and a tremendous influence uh, on those, uh, all those around him. And it's unfortunate when Hollywood ignores that part of a, uh, of a person's uh, life. They're getting ready to do it again with uh, what appears to be a very good movie coming out this weekend about Jackie Robinson uh, called 42. Uh, and uh, Branch Rickey, played by Harrison Ford. This is extra, no charge for this. A little movie review here. Uh, Harrison Ford plays Branch Rickey. Branch Rickey was a de devoted Christian um, businessman who wanted to try to use professional baseball to see integration come in so our country could be changed morally uh, in terms of of our relationships uh, with one and another. So as a devoted Christian, he looked for a really good baseball player who was playing uh, in the Black League and the African American League, but he had to find somebody not just really good, but somebody who was a deeply committed Christian who he could bring up into the major leagues, and then when he was reviled or slandered would not say anything back. When he was punched or hit would not punch back. Who understood the concept of turning the other cheek and he finally found that guy, that deeply committed Christian, Jackie Robinson. That part's omitted about the movie, though, unfortunately. <laughs> it's like Hollywood just doesn't want to admit to uh, the transforming power of, uh, of God's grace uh, in, uh, in our lives. 
Uh, but Lincoln, in this context, somebody came to him one time and said, Oh, Mr. President, I'm most anxious that the Lord should be on our side. And Lincoln replied, That gives me no anxiety at all. The thing I worry about is being on the Lord's side. And certainly that, uh, you know, in, uh, in many of the decisions we make and so forth, we need to be concerned, are we on the Lord's side? But in terms of salvation, in terms of redemption, in terms of being in heaven one day, we never have to consider that. We never have to think about it. Uh, we can be confident because God is for us. You know, uh, whoever, whatever might be against us will never affect our relationship with him. God is constantly for us. Secondly, in verse 32, we would say there's one conclusive act whereby God demonstrated his love for us. Verse 32, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? So again, the argument from the lesser uh, to, the, to the greater here, if when we were sinners, again, uh, Romans 5, 8, that uh, God demonstrates his love for us in this Yet while we were sinners, Christ died for our sins. If while we were sinners, if while we were on the run from God, if while we hated God, wanted nothing to do with Him, if He loved us so much then that He would send His Son to die on the cross for us, now that we're His children, now that we worship Him, now that we love Him, wouldn't He give us all things? See, that's His, uh, that's his argument. That's the idea. Uh, Jesus uses the same type of argument in Matthew 6, where He says, so why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which uh, to, uh, today uh, is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Uh, if, uh, if God does this and cares about the grass, won't he care about you? If God sent his son to die for you, won't he freely give you all things? Paul says in terms of the freely given us all things, what are we talking about? Well, Ephesians 1.3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Give us all things. A new Toyota truck, a new BMW, I could go on. No, that's really not the all things that he's talking about. He'll freely give us all things in regards to our relationship with him. Spiritual blessings from heaven. All the things that he's already mentioned. He's given us his Holy Spirit. He's given us a new nature. He gives us certainly natural abilities, but also spiritual gifts to serve others. He's given us his word. We could go on and on. He's freely given us all things so that we can live the Christian life in this life. He's given us a future. The hope of heaven, a resurrected body, being reunited to those that love, uh, that died uh, in faith in Jesus Christ, the tremendous future. Paul says he's freely given us all things. And doesn't this make sense, he said? While we're his enemies, he sent his son to die for us. Wouldn't he freely give us all things now? That's the idea. The old hymn by Horatio, Horatio Bonar says, What will he not bestow? who freely gave this mighty gift, unbought, unmerited, unheeded, unsought. What will he not bestow? He spared not his son. Tis this that silences each rising fear. Tis this that bids the hard thought disappear. He spared not his son. That's a good thing to remember. <laughs> Whatever we're going through, however we feel, God didn't spare his son for us. Even when we were at war with him, enmity, not seeking after him. How much more will he give us freely all things now? We can be confident because God's constantly for us. Secondly, he demonstrates that with one conclusive act. Three, is because no one can bring a charge against us. Verse 33, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Again, that word justify means a full pardon. Uh, the idea of you're, you're found guilty, you go before the judge. The evidence is there, but the judge steps in and he pardons you anyway. Redemption is that word about being purchased as a slave from the slave market and then the person sets you free. These are the ideas and the words that are used to describe our salvation. Titus 3, 5 says we're not saved because of the righteous things we've done, but because of his mercy. And, uh, uh, and uh, you know, we need to remember these things. 
It's not what we've done. It's what God has done for us. He has stepped in and justified. Remember the justification is God declares. God, God declares us to be uh, innocent of all charges against us. There's a uh, kind of a, a classic real life example uh, of this that I knew. I knew most of the story. I didn't know the little second part of it. Uh, true story about uh, Mayor Lagordian, of whom the airport is named after. He's uh, mayor in New York uh, in the 30s. And in uh, 1935, on a winter's night, uh, he just showed up at a court in one of the poorest uh, uh, parts of the town, told the judge sitting on the bench he was taken over for the night, put the judge's robe on, gave the judge, uh, judge the, the night off. And then one of the cases he hears is this uh, little grandmother uh, who's been brought in and she's uh, charged with the theft of bread. And, uh, and he begins to talk to her about it. And she says and explains, my daughter's husband deserted her. She's sick. And, my, and her children, my grandchildren, are, are starving. And, uh, of course, he's very sympathetic uh, to, to her uh, and is known as a very generous man and very well-liked uh, in New York City at the time. Uh, he says, uh, talk to the storekeeper. Well, what do you say? And he says, well, it's a bad neighborhood, Your Honor. She's got to be punished to teach other people a lesson. So he turns to the old woman and says, I've got to punish you. The law makes no exception. $10 or 10 day, days in jail. 10 bucks is a lot of money in uh, 19, 1935. I don't know what the equivalent would be uh, today. I'm sure it would be several hundred dollars. But uh, uh, while he pronounces judgment upon her, at the same time, he reaches into his own wallet, takes out $10, throws it in a hat, his hat, to give to her so she can pay the fee and go free. Now that's a, a demonstration of the judge pardoning the person that was guilty. But the story is better than that. He, he goes on and says, here's the $10 fine, which I now remit. And furthermore, I'm going to fine everyone in the courtroom 50 cents for living in a town where a person has to steal bread so that her grandchildren can eat. Mr. Bailiff, collect the fines and give them to the defendant. <laughs> and the following day, a New York, New York newspaper reported that $47.50 was turned over to the bewildered old grandmother who had stolen a loaf of bread to feed her starving grandchildren. Making forced donations were a red-faced storekeeper, 70 petty criminals, and a few New York policemen. That's the grace of God. He doesn't just pardon us, then he freely gives us all things. Uh, it would be enough. It would be enough would it, just to be forgiven. Uh, but it's so much more than that. And there is no one then can, that can bring an accusation against you or against I in the court of heaven uh, ever again. Is there an accuser? Yeah, we have an accuser. It's Satan. And uh, John writes about him in Revelation 12.9. So the dragon was cast out, the serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of the brethren. He accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and all of the good works that they had done in their life. No, it doesn't say that, does it? And they did not love their lives unto death. Simply the blood of Jesus Christ and their testimony of what they have done, praying and giving their lives to the Lord. That's how he was overcome. But Satan, there's a future scene yet to be acted out. Satan is in heaven accusing the brethren day and night. And if you really think about it, he's probably got a little bit of ammunition on every one of us. There's certainly things he could say and accuse of, things we should have done that we didn't do, things that we uh, uh, shouldn't have done, and so forth. Uh, and, uh, and, but we don't have to worry about it, because we're going to read in a moment, Jesus is at the right hand of God making the intercession for us. But besides that, if God is for us, who's against us? He's the one that's pardoned us. He's justified us. No one can bring an accusation against us. And I just want to say at a practical level, but the way that Satan primarily brings accusations is through other people. Through other people. When, when people, whether it's on an internet blog or something, a conversation on a phone, a text message or whatever else, when somebody is slandering somebody else and bringing an accusation against somebody else in the body of Christ, 
just read this and figure out where did that come from. It came right out of the foot of hell. That's Satan. Satan's the accuser of the brethren. Sometimes he uses other people. And we need to be very careful uh, not to entertain it. Uh, not to even when we get it on the internet just to go, very weird, did he? You know, that's really the easy thing. The best thing to do is hit reply. Hey, you're blowing it here, brother. You know, the Bible is very clear. You know, you know, you're slandering at this point. You need to repent. You need to change. You need to help that other person so they don't continue down that road uh, in, uh, in sin. And have it become a habitual part uh, of their own life. But we don't have to deal with accusations against us. No one can bring a charge against us. By one conclusive act, God has demonstrated his love. And praise the Lord, he's consistently for us. Well, number four is in verse 34. Why? It's because God doesn't condemn us. Verse 34, who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. So based on the premise uh, that uh, there isn't anyone who can condemn because of the fact that we've been justified, and now he adds the fact that Jesus is the one that is interceding, that is praying for us. He is our great high priest. He is our advocate. He understands exactly what we're going through uh, in our lives. He is the one that took on human flesh and lived this life and knew what it was to be lied to, to be betrayed, uh, and, uh, and so forth, to deal with hypocrisy and the, and the false religious systems of the world, uh, the oppression and the attacks of the enemy and the temptations. He lived through all of that and was, was victorious over it all. He understands exactly where we're at. Hebrews 7.25 says, Therefore, he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. There's an example of this in, in the Gospels that's uh, very interesting. This is uh, uh, the night, of course, before Jesus is going to the cross, recorded in uh, Luke's Gospel, chapter 22. Uh, Peter has just made the statement about the fact, they'll all deny you, I'll never deny you, and so forth. And certainly, you just have to love Peter. And, uh, uh, and we, uh, we love him for his faults, uh, as, as well as uh, the outcome of uh, God's work in his life. But notice what uh, Jesus says to him in response. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you've returned to me, strengthen your brother. <laughs> you know, I'm just going to say, I'm not actually sure exactly what that is to be sifted as wheat. But that would make me a little uncomfortable if Jesus said, said, Tim, Satan has asked for you. He's going to sift you as wheat. I don't think that would be like really good news right there, you know. Uh, but and I'd be a little encouraged when Jesus says, but you know what? I prayed for you. Me? Yeah, I prayed for you. I'm still praying for you. And uh, you know what? After you blow it, I'm going to strengthen you. I'm going to bring you back. And when you do, encourage your, your, your brothers. I mean, that's what Peter's going through. I don't know if he really fully understand, but obviously he remembers the conversation uh, later. Uh, and that's what Paul is telling us now. That whatever Satan is planning, whatever he's going to throw at you, Jesus is at the right hand of God, making intercession, praying for each and every one of us all of the time, constantly, consistently, caring for us, praying for, interceding. Satan can't get to you only to the degree, as in Job, that it enters in the context of the will of God. What a comfort that should be to us. One writer put it this way. If we're condemned, it will be over Christ's dead and now resurrected body, which actually is the basis for our salvation. How is that for, for confidence? Satan wants to condemn you. Jesus says, not over my dead and resurrected body. It's never, it's never going to happen. Uh, that, that's reason to be, to be confident. God is constant, consistently for us. He demonstrates it conclusively. And uh, no one can bring a charge against us. God does not condemn us. And five, it's because circumstances cannot separate us. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. 
And again, Paul begins to be autobiography, uh, biographical at this point. He's really describing his own life, some of the things that he's been through. But he's still saying that uh, nothing can separate us from uh, the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. And the, the who here, who shall separate us, can also be translated what. It doesn't matter if it's a who or a what. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. He quotes uh, Psalm 44, verse 22, to show that tribulations for believers is nothing new. Israel went through it all the time, and, uh, uh, and that's his uh, reference here. And this whole point is that not only uh, uh, can circumstances not separate us, as he said earlier in verse 28, he will even use them for good, our good, our eternal good, uh, and for God's glory. When things try to come against us, we can endure trials for his sake uh, since we know he'll never desert us. He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. Now, the fifth point and the sixth are tied together. Circumstances cannot separate us. And it's because, he says in verse 37, we're more than conquerors. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Uh, the word conqueror is the root word. Uh, is on some of your tennis shoes. It's Nike. You know, if you know what that means. Nike means victory uh, in Greek. Uh, and this is a form of that word. Uh, and then he puts in front of it the word uh, Hooper, H-U-P-E-R, transliteration of the Greek, which mean, we might say uh, hyper or like super. Uh, so we're super victorious. We're, we're more than conquerors uh, is, uh, is the idea there. Uh, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Uh, tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword, or sword. He goes, yeah, even sword, even death. What is the worst case scenario we could go through in this life? Well, you might, somebody might kill you. You're still more than a conqueror because death can't kill you. Uh, th in other words, uh, I'm starving uh, and I find some food. So I've, I've conquered my hunger. And he goes, well, yeah, that's true, and, uh, uh, and that would make you a conqueror. But what he's saying is you're more than that. You're a hyper, super conqueror because even if you faced starvation and didn't find any food and died, you'd still rise again. You're, you're more than a conqueror. Do you understand the concept of, uh, of what he's saying here? Uh, we know that trials can make us grow stronger uh, and not weaker, uh, and uh, sometimes the Lord allows that. Uh, so this idea of being more than a conqueror doesn't mean <laughs> everything really just works out dandy all, all the time. Uh, that's not what he's saying here. He's saying even, even a worst case scenario, we're still okay because we're, we're more than conquerors. In fact, Paul, in dealing with whatever physical problems that he was having out on the mission field, uh, uh, said this after pleading with the Lord for healing. He says in 2 Corinthians 12, 8, Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest on me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecution, in distresses, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul's quite the guy, isn't he? <laughs> he goes, I, I get it. I get the concept. So, therefore, I'm okay. I'm okay with persecution. I'm okay with uh, all, of this, all of this stuff. I remember reading a number of years ago in a K.P. Yohannan book. K.P., of course, is the president of Gospel for Asia. And, uh, and he was teaching. The book was based on uh, pastor's conferences that he was doing with, with those guys, the pastors in India which, uh, which uh, the kind of work they do for the Lord is a little different. I mean, they do face persecution. They do get, uh, get beat up on a, uh, on a regular basis uh, uh, and so forth. And, uh, and Strat was over there having uh, worked for them for about 10 years, and he was taking a group of donors around and showing them the ministry. And he was talking to one of the leaders one time in the training center, uh, one of the ones that, uh, uh, that I've been at before. Uh, and you've got, you know, a couple of 300 guys out there training for the ministry, you know, about a two and a half year program, then a mentorship after that, and eventually out to uh, evangelism and church planning. And so I asked him, of these guys right here, how many of these guys will face persecution and, and beatings and so forth when they go out to, to preach the gospel? And the, the guy running the school said, what do, you, what do you mean, how many? He goes, you know, like percentage, like, like, like 10% or... 
like 50%, what, what's the percentage that they'll actually face terrible persecution when they go out to preach the gospel? And he said, percentage? He goes, all of them. They will all face persecution. They will all be beaten for the gospel. They know that. They know that when they sign up. It's, it's just part of how it is here. I'm trying not to fall into my Indian accent. But I just tried to have to fight it off a little bit right there at the end. <laughs> all of them, all of them are going to face it. Uh, it's a different world. But, and that's what Paul's saying. We're more than conquerors. We're okay with that. Because Paul found that even in that, the power of Christ will rest on me. His grace is absolutely sufficient for whatever I need to go through. And KP's point in the sermon that I, that I heard him give is that one of the greatest weapons of spiritual warfare against us as believers is when the enemy knows that if he brings some kind of hardship and some kind of persecution against you, you'll give up. And if you'll surrender that to the Lord, you've taken one of his greatest weapons away. And he's telling these guys, if you'll surrender yourself to hardship and persecution, and whatever you might go through physically in this life for the sake of Jesus Christ, Satan will never be able to attack you with that. If you just agree to it now and give it to him now. We, we don't even talk about those kinds of things uh, in the church here uh, in America. Yeah, we face a time when we're in the post-Christian era. <laughs> there's there's uh, slanderous things said about Christians all the time. People's jobs are threatened because, uh, because there uh, they're are Christians. There's just uh, horrific news stories that are out there of, of Christians going through things, whether it's lawsuits and in the court system, whatever it might be, simply because they've taken a stand for Jesus Christ. And we could be discouraged and all that, but Paul says we're, we're more than conquerors. In fact, God will use it all for good in the end. We know that even trials uh, we have uh, certainly... Uh, 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 mean nothing as we consider the future. 2 Corinthians 4, 7, he says, our light affliction, that's what Paul says his work, his light affliction, which is but for a moment is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. I want to, I want to read to you a little bit from uh, Hebrews 11 because the writer there, Hebrews 11, of course, is the Hall of Fame of Faith. Uh, he talks about two groups of people to kind of help us illustrate this uh, a little bit more and maybe make it uh, applicable. Uh, in terms of being a super conqueror, what that uh, means, uh, his intent here. Uh, in Hebrews 11.33, it says, here's a group of people I think we all want to be part of. Uh, this is what I think of when I think of being a super conqueror, who, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. See, I like that. I want to be able to do that. Quench the violence of fire escape the edge of the sword out of weakness were made strong became valiant in battle turned to flight the armies of the aliens women received the dead raised to life again miracles valiant in battle super conqueror we like that right but then he goes on I hate, I hate to do this but he goes on and the first word and the next verse is the word others and in the Greek, it can mean others of the same kind, but it doesn't. It's others of different kind, but there's this other kind. These other kind of super conquerors. He says others. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had uh, a trial of mockings and scourgings. Scourging, as beating. Yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. Were tempted. Were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having attained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. They were still waiting for the Messiah to come. God, having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. That's a different group of And those guys are super conquerors? Paul says, yeah, those guys also. Both groups. Both groups are super conquerors. He goes on in chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, because of that, we also, us New Testament believers, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, the sin primarily of unbelief of belief and doubt. And let us run with endurance, as in a marathon race, the race that is set before us, 
How do we do it? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. His whole point. Both groups are super conquerors because the worst case scenario is the sword. And even that, he says, God will raise us back up. You know, we, we can endure a lot more than we think that we can by, by God's grace. And, uh, and what helps to be able to understand that is that nobody can bring a charge against us. Nobody can condemn us. God is constantly for us. Uh, nothing can change our relationship. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. Again, there's kind of a, a, a classic little dialogue from a guy named John Christentum in the 3rd century, 4th century. Uh, he lives uh, 347 four, uh, to four, uh, 407. I happen to have a picture of him. I just took that the other day. He's a very old guy now. But uh, <laughs> a little mosaic from the Byzantine area, but that's uh, supposed to be John there. But anyway, there's a little historic incident at the end of his life, dies as a martyr for his faith. That maybe helps uh, bring uh, our port at this point to a closure here. The, uh, the Roman emperor threatened him uh, with banishment if he remained a Christian. And basically, if you'll deny your faith, uh, we'll let you go free. Very much what uh, Pastor Sain is going through in Iran right now, the young, young uh, pastor that's there that we've been praying for. Uh, if you'll deny Christ, we'll let you go free. Of course, he uh, remains uh, uh, in prison there. Uh, but this is what uh, Christendom said. He said, uh, Thou cannot banish me, for this world is my father's house. The emperor says, But I will slay thee. Nay, they can't, cannot. For my life is hid with Christ in God. Well, I will take away all your treasures. No, you can't, because my treasure is in heaven, and my heart there is also. Then I will drive you away from man, and thou shalt have no friends left. No, you can't do that, because I have a friend in heaven whom you cannot separate me from. I defy thee, for there is nothing that you can do to hurt me. And then he was a, he was a super conqueror. They killed him, and he was with the Lord. That, it, that's a super conqueror. That's who God says. They we're all like, Man, I don't know if I could ever do that. No, God says that's who you are. I don't know where we're catching that. But he's saying that, Paul said, that's who you are, a super conqueror. All because of what Christ has done, what he's done uh, for us. It's a different perspective. It's meant to bring us security. It doesn't matter how bad things get. What's the worst case scenario? He says, you're, you're, still, you're still all good. Because it may, just means you're going to be with the Lord. Seven, he says, uh, it's because nothing created or supernatural can separate us. Verse 38, 39. Notice Paul gets so excited uh, in writing at this point, he shifts to the first person. Uh, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We might add some things like disappointment, neurosis, disease, a broken romance, financial crisis, insanity. You could add a lot of things, but it all falls under the same category. There is nothing created or even supernatural, Paul says, that can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. One of the things these days, and when we're going through a New Testament text, I'll, I'll, do, I'll kind of scan all the, uh, the Greek uh, tenses, uh, looking to see if there's any perfect tenses. And there's one here. It doesn't pop up very often. There's one here uh, when Paul says, I am persuaded. And remember, a perfect tense means that it's something that's happened in the past with continual results in the future. Paul's saying, in the past... I was fully persuaded of these things. And in the present, I'm fully persuaded of these things. And in the future, I will remain fully persuaded of all of these things that he's just said. Add, adds, a, adds a little to it. And, uh, and again, he wants us to know for sure about our salvation, our redemption, our relationship with, with God and what God's done, done for us. And I think for us, this is important if, uh, if you're a, a newer Christian. This is important if you haven't done a study like this uh, before. Or you haven't even read some of the words uh, of Jesus uh, talking about the fact that no one can, no one can snatch us out of his hands and, uh, and so forth. It's important for us to know that. But I think for all of us what's important is, is to reflect about what it is that Christ has really done for us. 
You know, we say this simple little prayer, asking Jesus to forgive us. We put our faith in his death and his resurrection. Uh, and and that's, that's this beginning to this whole thing that God begins to do then in our lives. And Paul is constantly exhorting us to grow in the knowledge uh, of grace, that we'd understand grace in a greater way. Because I think if we do, it'll cause us to love God more. It's his goodness that leads us to repentance. It, it's life-changing is the idea. If we understand who, who God is, did spare his own son while we're at enmity with him. How much more will he not give us all things now? The anxiety that we have in our lives, the fear that we live under sometimes uh, in our lives. You know, there, there's, you know, some of it's a little understandable and so forth, but we should be able to take whatever it is and process it and come out the other side and have this peace that, well, I don't know what North Korea is going to do. I really don't know if uh, we're going to have a war in the, in the Middle East with uh, Iran and uh, their nuclear cap capabilities uh, and so forth. Uh, I know if, uh, <laughs> as we learned this week, that, oh, it looks like they have been able to miniaturize their, their nukes enough to put them on the, uh, the nose cone of a missile. And we do know that the, the Russians are there helping them, and uh, all the top Iranian scientists are there every time they do a missile test. So some of that technology is probably going the other way. I don't know if you want me to keep telling you anymore, but uh, uh, there, there's a lot of interesting things going on in the world today. Uh, but they shouldn't cause us fear and anxiety because all, whatever happens, God is sovereign and God is in control. And all things are working together for good in all of our lives, individually and certainly and prayerfully, corporately together as a, as a church. And whatever happens is that in regards to our salvation, our relationship with the Lord, of being with the Lord for, uh, for everything, nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. And it's pretty descriptive. And he's pretty emphatic here at the end about that. So what then shall we say to these things? We should say, hallelujah, praise the Lord. That, that wasn't very enthusiastic, by the way. We should say, hallelujah. hallelujah. That was even better than I was hoping for. <laughs> I thought it was going to be me and Charlie, and that was it. <laughs> and I didn't have much voice left. Creation. You ordain the sun to rise and fall. You scatter the stars across the heavens. You come close enough to hear me call. Now I want to.
given everything to me. What can I do for you? You have given me a see. What can I do for you? You pulled me out of bondage and you made me renewed inside. Build up a hunger that I've always been denied. Opened up a door no man can shut, and you opened it up so wide. And you chose me to be among the few. What can I do for you? You have laid down your life for me. What can I do? 